Alright, well uh, I'm coming out of the crowd because I've never seen that video before. Um, I wanted to, to watch that. And uh, I'm pretty sure Kyle and Greta are going to sue for taking their music without permission and adding in some sort of Uganda cultural music in there. I'm sure they're deeply offended. In fact, they may not come back to this church. I also noticed that was a little bit like drinking from a fire hydrant in those rapid fire pictures. Um, and so to give you a little bit better perspective, as promised two weeks ago, it's taken us a while to get this together. We're going to have a couple people who came on the trip come up here, and I'm going to interview them and tell you a little bit about the Uganda trip. So Eli and Carrie are out here somewhere, conveniently located down front. Let's see if we can get these guys to, yeah, give them a hand. They're, there were actually some pictures of Eli and Carrie in there. See if those work. Are these on? Yeah. Austin, thanks. Gary, you want to use this one? Had to point it way down, huh? There we go. All right, so this is Eli and Kerry, and I told them that I would ask them a few questions, but I lied to them because I'm going to ask them some different ones just to mix them up a little bit to see if they're authentic or not. So they have a few prepared answers, but they don't know all of them. First of all, you may not know, but Eli was the only guy to go on the trip. Eli, did you only go because you were the only guy on the trip? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. <laughs> and did you ever have an opportunity to gladiator or braveheart like fight off? attackers to save the nine women that were with you? Yeah, just a little kid, so I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty I'm sure. sure. I'm sure that's true. Cool. So I'm gonna ask you guys a, a few questions. Uh, first of all, what was, both of you can respond to this, what was your favorite part of the trip? Uh, I think mine was just seeing these different organizations there that really are doing amazing things there for kids and families and um, Soul Hope working with the, uh, the Jigger problem there. And so just, see, just seeing what they're doing and seeing their heart for God and their love for the people there, that was really encouraging to me and probably my favorite part. Yeah, I agree. It was really cool. Um, we've been preparing this, for this trip for a long time, and so we've been doing a lot of preparation um, by making the shoes and cutting them out and spending a lot of time doing that. So it was really cool to be a part of giving them out. And I don't know, it was just a really big privilege to be a part of that process and be able to jump in and not really need any like special skills or training, but to be able to show people God's love in a really like practical way was really cool. Cool. Now, a lot of you may not know all the details of the trip, but we kind of have a, a vision as a, as a church and a community that we want things to kind of spawn from the church itself. And this is one of those things that really Brittany and Kaylee Jensen and a lot of people really own along with Eli and Carrie and the whole team really kind of, this is our first chance ever to take a big international trip. And we kind of call it a vision trip instead of a mission trip because we don't, you know, we don't want to get the idea that we're going over there to save the world in a week. Um, and it was a really great experience, I think. But I've been really curious um, and what I'd most like you to answer is what the most difficult thing was. Since it was our first go at it, what was the hardest part of the experience? Uh, for me, that was just like seeing these kids and, you know, we visited a couple of different orphanages or family centers and just seeing these kids that, you know, don't have a lot of hope going for them. Um, you know, they don't have families and they're just there and they're under, you know, care of you know four people that are trying to take care of 25 kids and just seeing how attention starved they are because they just they don't have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and that, that was really hard for me to see and to feel blessed at how you know I was raised and did have loving parents and um, it was pretty heartbreaking though to just kind of you know play with these kids and just um, just know that you know they don't really have a family to go home to at night. Yeah, and I think kind of along those lines, we learned a lot about um, just kind of the broken system while we were there. Um, we, went, we did go to a couple of orphanages and family centers, and hearing about what's not working was really discouraging and kind of hard at the end of the day when you pour into these kids and then you hear about how things aren't working. Um, so it was really discouraging, and there was a lot of good things going on too, and a lot of hope, but it was hard to see. Um, I guess I just learned like adoption in and of itself is not a one-dimensional thing. It's not just good. There's a lot of ripple effects and I don't know, there's a lot of stories behind that, but that was so, hard. Um, and then the last, the last thing for both of you to answer is if, if we did something like this again, whether it be back to Uganda, hopefully we'll do something like that again. What, what would you say to encourage people to take the risk to, to go on that trip? What would be a reason you would say to inspire them to go? Well, I like what Charlie said of it as this being like a vision trip. Um, you know, we kind of had a smattering of different uh, organizations that we encountered and learned about and worked with, and um, it was it was a good way to kind of feel out different organizations and see what they're doing and kind of get ideas of what you know how we can help them, um, both here in the states. You know, whether it's um, you know Soul Hope, 
uh, doing gene cutting parties or supporting uh, you know an orphanage financial financially. Um, we also visited a, a child sponsorship organization over there, and just those kind of things. Seeing those opportunities and really getting to see kind of behind the scenes how these 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 company or these organizations work and um, the best way to support them while we're over there. Yeah, I would say it was really amazing how much of Soul Hope is volunteer driven. 100% of their shoes are cut by people in the States, and I didn't know that. I thought we were just kind of supplementing what they already had going on, but, um, and they can't run their clinics without volunteers, so that would be a huge reason to go. It's just they really do need manpower to get things done. It's good, so you felt needed. Significant. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a hand. Thanks so much for coming up and sharing. Feel free, I know Eli and Carrie would both love to answer any questions you have if you want to ask about their trip or their experience or any of the other people that went on the trip that are here. Um, and Eli and Carrie can kind of point you as to who those people are. Now we're going to start as we always do, we're going to pray for another church in town. Uh, I had a really great privilege this morning of speaking at Hope Community Church. Uh, my friend Dave Reynolds is the pastor over there and Dave and Marcia are celebrating their 30 year anniversary and going to visit their very first grandbaby and kind of having two weeks of vacation. So I was covering for him this morning. Great community of people over there. I love getting to be with you. This is the second time I've got to do this over there. But I thought we'd pray for Dave and Marcia and, and Hope Community Church today. So if you're the praying type, join me and, and we'll, we'll lift them up. Father, thank you uh, for this special day in the calendar year. Um, God, we remember our fathers. We thank you for the gift of being dads. But hopefully, most importantly, uh, we see you as the perfect father and your unconditional love. And God, we thank you that you are the father of many diverse children around this world. We thank you for the body of Christ, especially today we pray for Hope Community Church. Um, we thank you for our family that meets together over there. God, I thank you for the, the warm hospitality that they offer. God, I thank you for their joy that they exude. I thank you for just that community of people in this town trying to see what it's like to follow after you. So we ask you to bless them, God. I pray that they will... Uh, always experience more of you. Specifically, we pray for Dave and Marcia. Thank you for their 30 years, God. Uh, thank you for him as a dad and, and now as a granddad. And I just pray you bless him in this special time. And pray you give him rest and peace as he's away. And, and let their church just flourish while he's gone. We, we love them. And God, I pray you strengthen our love with all churches and all people uh, as we draw close to you. Please open our eyes and ears today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, on this Father's Day, um, you might see some older dads and people like me kind of gimping around. Uh, a lot of us, I mean, it's really kind of cool to talk about Uganda and this big adventure that those guys went on. We just got back, there's about 15 of us guys from the commons that just got back really late last night from going backpacking in Colorado. Uh, I pulled my Achilles and uh, there's, some, there's some worse war wounds out there. I saw Stringer had like taped up feet from blisters. We went about, the 15 of us, there was about uh, an age range, I think 21 was the youngest, all the way up to about 56. A really diverse group of 15 guys, and it was really fun as we went on a great adventure together. I mean, we hiked almost 40 miles, a little less than 40 miles in about four days, really less than that. Um, so it was hard. Uh, it was one of those backpack experiences where you got you know 40 pounds of weight, and you're going together, and uh, you're you're always going, why am I doing this the whole time? And, uh, but we saw lots of beauty. We made all the Emerald Lake was kind of our goal. We went to this giant lake up in the up in the southwest Colorado, and then we went four miles up to this other lake called Moon Lake, which was just spectacular beauty. We were trout slayers. We were slaying trout without mercy. We filled up bags of trout like men, like barbarians, and we carried them forth to our campsite, and we slay them, and we gutted them, and we burned their flesh and ate them in their death. So I hope you're not an animal lover here today. Actually, I'm an animal lover too, but in all, all seriousness, I actually enjoyed crushing trout's heads because it gave me like a, I felt this connection to humanity. Here's what I mean by that. You know, we, I eat fish at the restaurant and we live in this world, we're so far removed from what the rest of humanity has pretty much experienced till modern times. But every once in a while, it's good to be reminded of the raw giving of a life and the irony. I almost laughed as I slayed these trout because they were trying to eat a little bug and take its life and I took its life. And someday something might take my life. And it's the circle of life. And that's your lesson for today. Treasure that in your heart. 
Actually, the, uh, the hardest part about today, and I'm going to ask for a lot of grace here, and I'm going to try not to keep doing this over and over again, but uh, the, the Summer Book Club series is upon us, which is uh, amazing. It's one of my favorite series or discussions we have throughout the year. Uh, but because we were gone and got back at a, after midnight last night, I didn't even know uh, which book won the vote until we got into Durango and had cell phone reception. I was assuming, because when I left, that the Lord of the Rings series was winning. And I did not want that to happen because, again, I'm embarrassed but I've never read Lord of the Rings, and that was not going to happen in one day. And uh, when I got back into town, I saw there was another heated race because you are a people of democracy, and you rise and vote when called forth to do so. And it was pretty close. In fact, my most entertaining uh, nominee on there was the Hardy Boys, number 183, the, the warehouse tumble that received nine votes. And actually, nine votes would have taken the cake had I not done a little investigative research and looked at who it was liking the Hardy Boys on Facebook. And I found that there were two Hardy Boys that liked it, which were fake Facebook accounts. So whoever it was that created fake Facebook accounts to add votes to the Hardy Boys, I salute you, but we're not doing your book. <laughs> Don't try to juke the system, because we're, we're the ninjas of democracy. Uh, the, winning book, uh, the winning book, ironically, was Donald Miller's book, to my surprise, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. I say ironically, because that's pretty much, I feel like, what we experienced hiking 14 miles yesterday. It was a, a million miles in a thousand years. It was more than a half marathon. We were really beat down, and I was kind of in the front group that got, uh, other than two, uh, Eli and Clay that left and did the whole thing super fast. And I, I watched everybody come in doggedly and tired up the trail. But this book, Donald Miller's book, uh, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, I'd never read before. And so having to get up and go teach at Hope Community, I just started reading this book at about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and I basically have just been trying to speed read. I, I've like tried to move my finger down the page. That didn't do anything for me. Um, and I made it, I actually made it through most of the book. And I kind of skimmed a couple chapters at the end and then read the last chapter. So I feel pretty good about the, the general feel of the book. Now, the reason I'm okay with that is because part of the purpose of the Summer Book Club series, one is to spur on discussion. And I hope to only kind of give a glance as to what the book is about and then transition us to somewhere in Scripture. This is what we always do, no matter what the book or the series is, to some message in Scripture that might have relevance for us. But i got to tell you right away that I love this book. Of course, I'm in the middle of it. I've just been reading it for the last three or four hours. Um, I was captivated again by Donald Miller's writing. Many of you, if you don't know Donald Miller, he's from the Northwest. Um, he kind of grew up in a kind of a controlling conservative church with a very controlling pastor, kind of a guilt-driven American evangelical thing. And he wrote a book called Blue Like Jazz that was a huge bestseller. I read Blue Like Jazz. I, I found his writing style charming. And, uh, you know, you, you really do think he's a very good storyteller, which is thematic to the book that he's that we're discussing today. Now, part of the thing about this book is it's an intriguing idea. In fact, when I read it, it, it won in Durango last night, and I went and I read, okay, what's this book about? I didn't like the idea. It sounded terrible to me. But basically what happened is he wrote this book, Blue Like Jazz. It was a huge success. He sold millions of copies. And then the basis of this book is that two movie producers came to him and said, we want to make a movie about your story, your life. You know, they're just wanting to make money because his book sold millions of copies. And so he kind of wrote this book in the process of figuring out these movie editors uh, writing about his life. And when I read that, I was thinking, this must be the most arrogant, self-absorbed book I've ever heard of in my life. He already wrote a memoir of his life, and now the movie makers are coming, and now he wants to write a book about the process. But I was pleasantly surprised. First of all, if you don't know Donald Miller, this is one of the most endearing things about him. He, he's very into uh, self, um, what's that word, not, not beating himself down, what's the humor? Deprecation. So, deprecation, self-deprecation. Thank you for your vocabulary, like Google out there. Yeah, he's into self-deprecating humor in the best of ways. He's charming, and he, he throws himself under the bus enough that you don't get the feel that he's arrogant. And, and when you read his stuff, you kind of sometimes wonder if he even has an editor at all, because it doesn't have the flow of other books that try to stream normal sentences together. But it has this kind of hipster Portland vibe to it that's uh, really, really enjoyable. And I, I'm just saying overall, I like the book. In fact, I, I'm not embarrassed to admit that I laughed out loud several times. That's an LOL if you're not down with the texty stuff. I also cried at times reading the stories that he wrote because he's such a good storyteller. And this is all in the last four hours. So I'm coming off a crazy roller coaster ride to try to give you something of value. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a few quotes. I'm going to try to summarize a few sections. Spoiler alert, I'm going to ruin the book for you at some point. That's kind of how this whole book club link thing works. But hopefully we'll get some sort of kind of narrative arc that will take us towards some scripture today that I think would fall right in line with what Donald Miller was saying. Now, what's the main premise of this story? Story. Donald Miller is a storyteller. 
And he's fascinated philosophically with the idea of story. In fact, the premise of his book really isn't that arrogant. It's really actually self-deprecating in the way that when these movie producers showed up, he picks them up at the airport in the snow and they go end up, I mean, he seemed like pretty cool guys. They end up riding around in a kayak in the snow and getting a bloody nose and he's, they throw out air mattresses and, and they pitch the idea that they want to make a story of his life. And he says, well, I don't know. It kind of seems like it won't be authentic if it's different. He says, well, as soon as they told me how much money they'd pay me, he was in. And then he found out that they thought his life was boring. And that's where the idea of this book came forth. He was kind of crushed in a sense that they wanted to change his memoir of Blue Light Jazz into a movie format. Because as scholars of story, they understood that a reflective book like Blue Light Jazz, with its kind of spattered essays on life and philosophical rants, wouldn't make good theater, wouldn't make good movie film. And so they basically told him to his face that night, your life is boring. And so he started this reflective process, which is this book on what kind of story is he living and what's the relationship of God with that? There's one quote I want to read to you from the very beginning of the book that kind of puts it in perspective. He's talking a little bit about just how his own life is filled with disappointments and boredom and those kind of things and suffering. This is what he says, talking about all of us. He says, somehow we realize that great stories are told in conflict, but we're unwilling to embrace the potential greatness of the story that we actually live in. We think God is unjust rather than a master storyteller. This is where he's kind of laying the foundation for the book. His idea for all of us, for him and his reflective process and for all of us universally, is that we're part of some master story and there is a master storyteller who is God. So that's kind of laying the foundation for how he's trying to think about his own life in the past and his he moves forward. Now there's a couple people that really influenced him. I wanted to just summarize a couple of the stories because I think that it kind of gives us a picture of why Donald Miller went on this journey of thinking about life as story, thinking about narrative as being central to the way we live our life. The first of them was his Uncle Art, and I'm just very much paraphrasing from what I remember a couple hours ago, but Uncle Art seemed to be the only man in his life. In fact, part of this whole book was his quest to find his own real dad and a twist in his own story when he, he did come face to face with his dad that was absent. But growing up, Uncle Art was the only man left in his life and he was kind of like, I think Donald Miller described him as a tree with deep, deep roots that could never be felled. No one could ever take down this tree. He kind of represented all that was strength and, and in, in somewhat of a Freudian sense, Uncle Art was like God. He was his picture of God. The, the man in his life was that, that way. Well, Uncle Art dies. And he goes to his funeral and he goes and he experiences the emotion of death in funerals and he thinks about the difference between Shakespearean tragedies and comedies and how some end with funerals and some end with weddings. And he's at this funeral and he's hearing people talk about Uncle Art who spent, I think he died in his 60s, but at the time he was leading a boys home to rehabilitate troubled boys in Florida. And he heard the story of how they came in angry and didn't want to be at this camp and Uncle Art would teach them about how to communicate and how to control their emotions and live in a relationship and find out about God. And Uncle Art loved old hymns and as they sit in this Florida graveyard and they sang these old hymns, he was overcome by the inspiration of the story of Uncle Art. Now I want to start there because this is a connection I have to the book and I've actually shared this with you before a couple times over the last four years. But I had a moment like this, and I think this is a really good idea for us understanding life as story. When I was on Young Life staff, I had a mentor that meant a lot to me. His name was Tom Raley. Uh, he worked on Young Life staff for 55 years. Um, he was somewhat in that little microcosm of a world of Young Life, a legend. And I trained under him for a few years, and he was 80 years old at the time that I knew him, around those four years that I knew him closely. And, and every time I talked to Tom, I felt like I was the most important person in the world. He was this kind of deep-rooted tree. He was this kind of person that when I think of what Jesus would have been like as an 80-year-old, it had to be something like Tom Raley, and only because he was becoming more like Jesus for so long in faithful service. But when Tom died, shockingly, I was in Flagstaff, I went back, and I, I went to Tom's funeral, and it was one of the most impactful things in my life. When I showed up at the funeral, there's thousands of people there, they were, they were carting people in, and the, the preacher at the funeral in downtown Dallas did the... I thought the greatest thing he could have done to start the service. He walked up to the microphone and he said, how many of you in this room, I mean, I think there was about 3,000 people there, he said, how many of you in this room only know God and God's love because of Tom Raley's direct influence in your life? <sighs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people stood on their feet. Right in front of me was this elderly lady that had been carted in in her robe with an oxygen tank. And I, I heard her story afterwards that Tom, as he was dying, had led her to the Lord as he was dying in a nursing home because he never stopped sharing his story of Christ. So Tom's life had this effect on me. I sat there going, 
I want to live a life like that. Donald Miller sat at his uncle's funeral and said, I want to live a life like that. In fact, he thought it to be tragic because his life was cut too short. And he asked the question, he said, if your life ends and it doesn't feel like it was cut off too short, you might not be living that significant of a life. So that's kind of the idea. He sees stories around him. He thinks of God as the master storyteller, and he goes on this whole journey to figure out what that looks like in application of life. He tells another beautiful story that made me tear up a little bit because it's Father's Day, and I just think it's a beautiful story. He had a dear friend in Portland. His name was Jason, I think, and they, they met at a coffee shop, and they're discussing life and things. Jason's struggling. But he's got this 13-year-old girl that's turned on him. And anyone who's a parent of a teenager knows the, this process with 13-year-old girls. And, and it, it became really bad. They found some drugs in her closet. And they were dating this guy that was just a loser. And, and it, he, you know, the guy would just fight with the dad. And he loved his daughter dearly. And they, he started fighting with his daughter. And they would try grounding her. They tried everything, and it wasn't working. And all of a sudden, he said, man, it, it sounds to me like your daughter, and I think her name was Rachel, is going through just a terrible story right now. She's in the middle of a terrible story. And Jason thought about that, and they left. They didn't speak. Donald met him months later and heard a little bit more. And he said, hey, I thought that night about what you said about her being in a terrible story. And I, did, I made some really bad mistakes, but some good came out of it. I had this whimsical idea. I took out a second mortgage on my house. I did some research on the Internet. I found out that you can build orphanages with $25,000. And that we can't even close to afford that. But I restructured everything. He said stupidly without telling my wife, thinking it would be a good idea to surprise her with this. He sits his wife and his daughter down at dinner and he says, hey, I just took out a lot of money we don't have. We're building an orphanage in Mexico. He said his wife and his daughter didn't speak to him for days. But then when they did, he was washing dishes and his wife came up and kissed the back of his neck. He obviously, he was frustrated that he didn't tell her and said, I, I want to go on this adventure with you. I love that you're doing something significant. And then to their shock, Rachel came out that night. They're in bed, crawled in bed with them like she did when she was a little girl. And she said, can we go to Mexico? I think if I put it up on Facebook, maybe we can get some people to help out with these orphans. And he said, in those two months, Rachel's life completely changed. She broke up with that guy. She took all those pictures down and put pictures of the orphans up in her house. He said, Donald, when you just challenged me to think about the story she was living, I was realizing that she was a good character, but she was in the wrong story. And I gave her a different story, and the real Rachel came out. She became a different person. And as far as we know, as he tells in the book, she's really healthy by getting this new thing. In fact, he has this really good quote in there. I didn't mark it in here, but it was something to the effect that heroes don't date losers. And my daughter figured out she was a hero and she could no longer be with that loser. I don't know what to say. I love that poor kid too. I hope somebody's taking care of that boy. But anyway, the idea is that story matters. It transforms people. Now, here's another great quote from the book as we're kind of passing along because this has to do with how he views life in this whole narrative. I'm going to read the whole quote because I, I love the way he writes and I like the way he says this. He says, your brain doesn't stop growing until you turn 26. So from birth to 26, God is slowly turning the lights on and you're groggy and pointing at things and saying circle and blue and car. And then you're saying sex and job and health care. He says, the experience is so slow, you could easily come to believe that life isn't that big of a deal. That life isn't staggering. What I'm saying is I think life is staggering and we're just used to it. We're all like spoiled children, no longer impressed with the gifts we're given. It's just another sunset. It's just another rainstorm moving in over the mountain. Just another child being born. Just another funeral. I think he's a good writer. Yeah. I think that's good stuff. I think we are spoiled children. I think we miss sometimes in this narrative that we're in, because we're a character in the story, that life is staggering. He, he has another thought about if we don't change in the process here. He says, not living a better story would be like deciding to die, deciding to walk around numb, until you die, and it's not natural to want to die. He, he goes on this really great analogy in the following chapter. He starts talking about this friend he had at Reed College. Reed College was kind of the setting for Blue Like Jazz, a lot of it. And he had this one friend who did his, he was an art major, and he did this final thesis on the way the physical human body changes in relation to our philosophical selves. And so he took pictures over a year of his own body. I mean, he took microscopic little macro pictures of his skin to see if there was changes in that year. He took pictures of babies and older people, and he studied philosophy, and he tried to put together this final thesis that the way our physical bodies change dictate and demand that our lives are supposed to be on a narrative curve. Those first 26 years are supposed to be an absorption of information 
awe and wonder. And then we transition into these maybe these strong, healthy years, hopefully, and the, the conflict of life and trying to figure things out. And then our bodies slow down and we reflect and we remember and hopefully we still find significance. But he, he has this great kind of journeying path to try to figure out what exactly it is that we were meant for in this story. Now, here's the thing. And this is where the story gets good. Any story's not good unless there's a problem. He understands that there's a couple voices in the story. And this is the thing that I think is most relevant to us. And I, I thought one of the most charming parts of the book, too, is that he actually is a writer. And he thinks about, in fact, he, he kind of tells a funny story about writing a really cheesy novel that didn't ever work out. And how the characters in the novel, and he said, any writer will tell you this. I don't know this because I'm not a writer in such a way. They will tell you that the characters themselves define the story. You'll walk to your typewriter or your computer thinking, this is what I want the characters to do. And then as you start typing and you know the characters that you thought up, they themselves will rebel against the story. They'll go somewhere else. They'll do something different. Now, that was kind of new information to me, not as a writer. But he made that analogy and said that it's not that different with us and God. In fact, the way he said it is he said, I could see God sitting at his computer, staring blankly at his screen, as I ask him to write in some money and some sex and some comfort. He understands that he's the character in the story. And God, the master storyteller, has this meta narrative for his life and also has this huge space for free will and also recognizes, designed our character, our individuality. God sits there in some ways wanting to write, and I'm not saying in some sort of controlling double predestination kind of way, but wanting to whisper into our ear a narrative that is significant for our lives. And we as characters often look back and say, hey, author, if you could just write in some money or sex or comfort, that would be great. And it reminds me of that C.S. Lewis quote about how insatiable we are, how we, we will settle for anything compared to the ultimate joys that God wants for us. We're kind of bent towards comfort. And he talks about God and his voice, and he talks about this other voice, this destructive voice, the problem that there's going to be pain involved. I'm going to read, this is the last section I'm going to read of this book before we transition, because I think this whole section is, is well-written about the pain and the challenge of changing your life. He says, here's the truth about telling stories with your life. He said, it's going to sound like a great idea and you're going to get excited about it. And then when it comes time to do the work, you're, going to want to, you're not going to want to do it. It's like that with writing books and it's like that with life. People love to have lived a great story, but few people like the work it takes to make it happen. But joy costs pain. Now he goes on an extended rant. Um, there's a lot of beautiful stuff in the following chapters about how he thinks... The thing that paralyzes us, and he uses humorous stories like trying to join the gym and get physically healthy, is that fear is the thing that paralyzes us. And he mentions in there that in the Bible, in all 66 books, there's over 200 references to do not fear. It's the number one command in the whole Bible. It's the one thing God wants to make clear beginning to end. Do not let fear control your life. I love those car stickers that have the love is greater than fear. I don't know if you've seen those around, the little math sign, love is greater than fear. And that's part of the narrative story. He tells great stories in here of Bob Goff. Bob's a, a guy that I got to meet and he talks about Young Life Camp up there and going on all these great adventures. But as the book progresses and he finds his dad again and he, he enters into a relationship in Monty, uh, at, uh, what's the Peru place? Machu Picchu. Um, and he loses this relationship with a girl and he's going through his own narrative because he's taking risks and he's fighting fear. He finds at the end of the book that he likes stories that are deep and slow. And he wants to be a part of a life that's in process, that's changing towards significance and not letting fear drive it. And I think that's somewhat of a, a thesis, but here's the, the parts of scripture I want you to see that I think Donald Miller would really like. One of them is my favorite, and I know I've shared this before, but I can't think of a more relevant passage of scripture from the life of Christ and what he's talking about, do not fear. This is one of the most famous stories from the life of Jesus there is. I'm going to look at one story from the life of Jesus and I'm going to look at one passage from Paul to close this where I think Paul is almost speaking exactly like Donald Miller. We're going to go right now to Matthew chapter 14. This is what it says. This is Jesus walking on water, but that's not the point I want to look at. It said, immediately Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and they go on ahead of him to the other side of the lake, talking about the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowd. And as always, there's a crowd around Jesus. After he had dismissed them, he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. 
Now, as many of you know, I, I talk all, all the time, basically just bragging in your face that I got to go to Israel and I got to see the Sea of Galilee, to see the size of this lake and kind of get a perspective of what this would have looked like for this kind of tempest to roll in. And I'm always amazed by the, the few stories in these kind of Greco-Roman biographies, these eyewitness narratives that these fishermen were terrified by waves. These people lived on the Sea of Galilee, but these were huge storms. And right after that, this, as this is going on, it says, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. This is supernatural. This is the miracle. It says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Here comes fear. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And you know I'll never pass over that common pass phrase from Jesus. Take courage without pointing out that courage is something that can be taken. Courage is out there for us to take hold of. We don't have to let fear rule our lives. We can reach out and take it. Jesus calls them to take courage. But here's the reason I wanted to come to Matthew today in the Gospels, in this story. Because for some reason, as strange as it is, Matthew's the only one that records the next thing. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. This is the only one. Matthew, the tax collector, he's the only one that records that the end of the story wasn't Jesus walking on the water. Peter, this kind of lovable, self-deprecating Donald Miller type character in the stories, this kind of brute fisherman, he looks out on the water and he sees Jesus walking there. And in his own story, he says, I want to do something incredible. I want to do that too. He says, if that's really you, Jesus, tell me to come out there with you. What does that tell you, by the way, about Jesus? I mean, that's the way he's going to identify if this ghost creature is really Jesus because he knows that Jesus would want him to be out on the water with him. Tells me that Jesus is playful. Tells me that Jesus would be the kind of guy that Peter would know he would want him to do that. And of course, we hear Jesus, come on, let's do it, Peter. It says, Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. Now, obviously, a lot of us know how the story ends. He loses a little faith. He sinks. Jesus picks him up and says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? They go in the boat. It's a big party. Because every story with Jesus seems to end in some sort of party or celebration. Now, here's the thing. Peter was unique. Because he was thinking whether or not he was using the semantics or the language of narrative and story, I want my story to be incredible. The other disciples could have, I guess we can assume, asked the same thing and Jesus would have allowed any of them to walk on the lake that day. But Peter did not let fear rule his life. Peter took courage. He stepped out of the boat and he experienced life to the full. He experienced the adventure of knowing Jesus. Now I want to transition to 1 Corinthians 3. Now this is... Great letter to the Corinthians. Obviously, the poem in 13 is one of the most beautiful things Paul ever wrote. And Paul, by the way, reminds me a little bit of Donald Miller. He writes sometimes in sputtered fragments. And I often wonder, I know Paul didn't have an editor because he wrote kind of sloppy sometimes and sometimes beautifully. But here's an interesting section where he's talking about our relationship to our God as the great storyteller and the significance of all of life. This is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. He says, For we are God's fellow workers. Some translations say co-workers. That's a cool stopping point. We work together with God. What kind of relationship is this? What kind of work are we doing? He says, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He said, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. He's talking about teaching the gospel to them. And someone else is building on it. He's talking about the local people who are teaching them about a significant life in God. It says, but each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I really like this, and I know you guys probably get sick of, especially there's only probably two or three of you that care at all about philosophy. But I like this, this idea here about the foundation of our life. Because Descartes was really influential on our modern minds. In fact, foundationalism is one of the things that if you look it up on Wikipedia, you're going to learn all about Rene Descartes. You're going to learn about stripping all your knowledge away to a foundation that I think, therefore I am. That's the bottom. That's the base. Paul is saying, no, I, I wrestle. He, he wrestles with Stoic philosophers and all the Athens, the Greek, the Roman philosophers. He's saying, no, the foundation is Jesus Christ. That's the bottom. That's the base on which we know our love, our security. It's that God showed up on our planet in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the whole climax of the, the whole story of the universe. That we have a foundation because we know that we are loved. 
We know that we can build on a foundation and work together with God because we are loved in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's saying. There is no other foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. He says, if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day, the capital D day, will bring it to light. What on earth is Paul talking about here? He's talking about a blank slate. See, Donald Miller, part of his whole narrative thesis in this book is that in some essence we are writers and there's a blank page in front of us and we get to write our life on that blank slate. Paul's saying we've got a huge blank slate in the foundation of Jesus Christ, the security of being loved by God, being part of this greater story that we're not the center of, but we're right in the middle of. Donald Miller says we're a tree in the forest and the forest is the big deal. But as this story unfolds and there's a foundation, he says, build whatever you want with God. Built with gold or stones or wood or hay. There's this individual you that's going to create something of significance. And if you build that life on a foundation of Jesus, if you have that in a community of believers in your relationship with God, he says it will last in the day. He's talking about the same kind of idea that Jesus often talked about. Some future day when everything that's not important is stripped away and only the things that are important remain. This, this end of the whole meta narrative where redemption happens for everything, us, the planet, the universe, everything is redeemed. On that day, he says, what you built with God will matter. Listen to what he says next. He says, it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer the loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Now, What I don't want to do is tiptoe into the centuries of theological debate on what kind of theme Paul is talking about here. Is this saying that everyone will be saved, that there's a refining fire? And you know, there's many times I've addressed these very difficult, mysterious, wonderful questions about what sort of future is for those that don't know Christ. And there's a lot of mystery there. But I want to focus specifically today, I want to avoid that a little bit and focus on the idea of what I think is central to what Paul is saying. What he's saying is in Christ, when we write our story on a blank slate, when we build our house on a foundation, which by the way echoes the story that you might recognize of Jesus and the builder who builds on sand or builds on stone, what stays on stone remains. What does that mean? It means it's significant. It means that our lives are made to be significant. It means there will be people who build with whatever they want on the wrong area or with the wrong stuff And some sort of metaphorical fire will sweep it away. And they will be left with a life that was not a great story. So here's the challenge. Here's the so what. Here's why it matters to us. Every single one of us, no matter where we are on that great physical journey of pre-26 brain development or in our 80s reflecting and slowing down, whatever it is, we've got to decide where we are in this story. We've got to figure out if our lives are significant. We've got to figure out if this ending came and everything is burned up in life. Are you going to stand there having built something with God, a great story? A story like my friend Tom Rayleigh, a story like Donald Miller's Uncle Art. I would argue maybe even a story like Donald Miller or, or Bob Goff, who he mentions. These great people who've given their lives to leave the negative voice behind. Take all those things that would strip us of the story. In fact, i got to go on a little tiny side tangent here because one of my favorite parts of the later part of the book is when he went off on a rant about advertising. And he was talking about how when he studied advertising, he learned that most humans are exposed to somewhere around 3,000 images of advertising in a given week. And, And he said the reality is they trained him to make advertisements a narrative. In the same way this narrative is supposed to be this kind of glorious thing we build together with God, there's this world that we live in as Americans where we're told the same story over and over again. You're miserable. You don't have enough. Here's the thing that can fix that. Go buy that and you will then have enough. We see that narrative over and over and over again. So we're stuck to our smartphones and we're stuck to our TVs. And Donald Miller was one that said, I'm not going to do that anymore. He turned off the TV. He killed all that. He ended up hiking in Peru, which we don't all have financially the ability to do. But he also went down to the coffee shop. He wrote letters to friends. He bought flowers for people. He apologized. He sought out his dad. He lived his life by killing the voice that was killing him. He listened to the voice of the master storyteller. And the challenge of the book, and I think it's a haunting one for most of America, is are you willing to stop listening to the other voice 
and asking the screenwriter, the great writer for just sex, money, and comfort, say, take me on the journey, the journey that includes pain, and let's build something together with God. That's the challenge. Do you want to live a life that's significant like that? We're going to share communion as always, and as I want to challenge you in today's communion. Is, communion is a time of reflection. It's much more than that. There's a lot of mystery at the communion table. Um, this represents, as you know, as I often say, communion is a, is a picture and a physical taste of the giant meta-narrative. The whole story from the beginning of who created us and why he created us, what went wrong, and the promises made in Israel, the fulfillment in Jesus. And by the way, one of the greatest things about his book is how he talked about the way any epic story goes. Because he realized as he's making his movie about Blue Like Jazz that this was not going to be an Academy Award winner. And it was not going to be an epic movie. And he asked these story gurus, why is it not epic? He said, because an epic story has an epic character who is essentially pure, who will sacrifice everything for the greater good. And that's why Jesus is the greatest story. I don't know if any of you are familiar with John Eldridge's work with Wild at Heart and, and many of his other works, that the, the story of Jesus is really written on our heart, that there is someone who sacrificed everything as the greatest hero so that we can be reconnected to God and then be a part of the story. So in a way, communion is our connection to that story. It's a mystery. And the way we celebrate it here at this church, it's an open table. Anyone is welcome at this table. It's an optional table. There's no reason you should have to come. But it's an invitation to take Christ in us, to be a part of the story that he's inviting us into, and to hopefully live a life of significance. Let me pray over these elements and we'll share this time. God, I thank you for this community. Thank you for all the people that voted for this book. I'm thankful for the opportunity to read it, to be challenged by um, Donald's great thoughts and the way you're interacting in his story, and he's willing to share that with us. God, I pray that as we come to this table, Lord, we will do it humbly, recognizing, God, the we, we just don't want to be spoiled children that think this is just another sunset or another communion. God, this is a connection to... 2,000 years of remembering you, 2,000 years of experiencing you, billions of brothers and sisters sharing a table together, and also a time just between you and us where we remember that you were that kind of hero, that you paid the price for our sins, that you give us hope, that your love conquers all the darkness within us. And God, we, at this time, um, acknowledge your presence. And God, I pray for all of us in this room that we will experience your real presence, God. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this gift. We thank you for this sacrament. We love you. Amen. Uh, every Father's Day, I think, I've shared the same story because it's my favorite. I think I'm going to try to share this every Father's Day forever, but... Um, so if you've heard this before, sorry, I love it. Uh, and actually, I've done it wrong in the past. I've told you this story about Maya Angelou, who we at least recently lost, but I found out it actually wasn't Maya Angelou. It was a different uh, African-American poet who was being interviewed about her great skill as a poet. And she was saying, uh, the, the interviewer was saying, what is it that makes you such a great poet? What is the thing? You know, was it school? Was it education? Was it some person you read their words? She said, no, it wasn't any of those things. I know exactly what it was. So, well, what was it? What makes you a great poet? He said, I'm a great poet because when I was a little girl and I walked into the room, my dad's eyes lit up. He said, that's why I'm a great poet. The reason I love that story, first of all, if you're a dad or a mom, make sure your eyes light up when your children come in the room. That's, that's the easy part. But I love it because it's also how God feels about us. That's the foundation we build on. God feels that way about us. He lights up when we come into the room. We're the characters in his story, and he's ready to be a master storyteller. He's ready for us to shape it into something spectacular. And I wanted to say that I love this community because I see those stories happening. You know, in the short time we've been meeting as a family, we have Ugandas and backpacking trips and serving at, the, at Hope Cottage and uh, serving the homeless and all sorts of things that you've dreamed up because you're building significant lives. You're telling stories that are significant. And I would say, to go back to the C.S. Lewis book, we want to go farther in, deeper in. We want to keep going to write a story that's truly significant eternal. On that note, there's a couple announcements <laughs> to follow up. Um, 
First of all, we have a core group meeting. Uh, there's a core group meeting that is not on the Commons Connection on the 28th. And if you don't know what the core group is, that's all, that's everybody that's the hands and feet of this place. There's over 70 volunteers throughout the year that do child care and set up tear down and music. And, and by the way, I've been so thankful for our bands that have been filling in for Colin and Greg. They've done a great job. All these guys. Quaz even playing that drum with a sliced finger because he can't handle a big boy knife. Can't put it. <laughs> He, he was actually going to claw hammer some banjo today, but he had to go to drums because he, uh, <laughs> he cut his finger. It's cute. Anyway, so anybody that's a volunteer is the core group. And so on the 28th, we're going to go to the Collier's house. We're going to have a barbecue. We're going to hang out. And we're going to dream up, just uh, as always, kind of quarterly, what we're going to do as the hands and feet of this church. So if that's you, make sure you get to that. Also, Parents' Night Out is next weekend. That's free babysitting night. Today's the last church service before that, so make sure you sign up tonight to get on that because that's a free date night. That's going to be actually hosted at my house. I won't be there. I'll either be on a date or in Texas, but our, it'll, be a, it'll be a party there. So make sure you sign up for that. I think that's it. Let me pray for you guys, and we'll take off and hopefully have a great week. God, thanks so much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, for us to be together. Thanks for the great books that we've looked at. I thank you for the gift of this one. And I thank you, God, that we are living this story together. Yeah, that we are not uh, individuals on a journey, but we're a group of people trying to figure out what it's like to be caught up in your greater story. I pray that you let us leave here inspired. I pray you let us leave here taking courage. God, I pray we can leave fear behind. I pray we can leave behind the voices that are negative, the lies of our culture. God, that we can grasp onto significant lives. And God, we thank you for being the great and perfect Father on this day. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.